Hey guys, Brian Reynolds. You're watching the Appraisal Report webinar brought to you by the fine folks over at Appraiser eLearning. You need some education? Check us out at Appraiser eLearning. Ah, uh, you'd be glad you did. We got a lot going on, virtual classes, online classes, a few live classes here and there, and we'll certainly be at the conferences that are coming right around the corner. We would like to thank LIA administrators uh, for their continued support of the Appraisal Report webinar, as well as the Appraisal Update podcast. Uh, if you haven't checked that out, jump over to our YouTube channel and do so. Doing a thing a little different this time with the Appraisal Report webinar. We're super excited. Uh, this will be available to watch uh, as a replay on YouTube but it's not being streamed live on YouTube. So if you want to be here for the live event, you have to register. As you uh, may know already, you can ask questions during the broadcast and we encourage those. Now we're probably gonna save the questions for a little bit later on in the program, but we will answer as many questions as we possibly can. And I am, I am super excited to have my guest, Mr. Jim Aaron. Uh, Jim, come on in. Uh, listen, man, this guy has been all over the place. <laughs> you have taught classes, I mean, really all over the world. Is, is that fair to say? Well, in, in a lot of places around the world. I don't think I've been to Antarctica yet, but uh, <laughs> short of that, I've been around the world. So, so he's taught throughout the United States. He uh, he's taught in uh, Germany, Italy, uh, Saudi Arabia, Japan, Mexico, Canada. He's been two times the national president of the Appraisal Institute, a really important guy, a very smart guy and an author of a new book here. Jim, tell us about this book and wh what made you want to write this book? Well, Brian, thank, thanks for having me. I pre appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I uh, want to thank all the, the folks who have joined uh, for, for listening in. Um, the book started out as a, a single article. Uh, uh, about a year ago, I, I started to get interested in AI, particularly after ChatGPT first came out. Uh, and I, like a lot of people, I used it a little bit and was frustrated and but I, I kept digging into it. I'm a very curious person, and I don't like to take no for an answer. And as I started to use it, I started to realize there were a lot of ways that this could be practical for appraisers. Uh, the overriding concern I had was around uh, the ethical use of it. And so I started to write an article about the ethical use of uh, artificial intelligence. And when I finished that article, I thought, well, you know, maybe I need to show people how to use this thing. So I kind of did a how-to article. And then I wrote a third article uh, that was actually case studies or uses of, of this. And once I finished all that, I thought, well, heck, I've almost got a book here. So let me fill in the blanks and uh, add to it. And uh, that's that's the genesis of the book. It started out as an article and turned into something much more. Wow. Wow. That's interesting. So I, I've, I've got lots of questions for you, but I know you've got a presentation. I want, I want to get to that in just a moment. Uh, but I, I want to really kind of simplify this or, or what I tell people that are smarter than me. And that's most people for me to understand, we got to dumb it down. Right. And, and I'm just talking about me. I, I, I tell, uh, Greg Abel, he's an MAI that, that does some work for me. Dumb it down, dumb it down. I've got, you're talking to me. I got to understand this. So, so you mentioned chat GPT and there's, there's people on this call right now that have never heard of that. They don't know what that means. So start with that. And, uh, and then, and then I'll ask you a couple more questions. We'll get into your presentation. Okay, great, Brian. So GPT stands for generative pre-trained transformer. Uh, and that means absolutely nothing to anybody, right? So basically what a transformer is, is the back end, it's the artificial intelligence piece of this. It's the, it's the way the systems work together to kind of create um, content. The, the pre-training comes from the fact that you have to train these models first. And so what they do is they take basically all the information from the internet that they can get their hands on, Wikipedia, uh, Substack articles, all this kind of stuff. They feed the model. And what they're trying to do is predict what the next word in a sentence is. That's really all these things are doing. And at the end, your output is the most likely outcome. 
Um, so the generative part of GPT is the fact that it can generate text, it can generate audio, it can generate video, it can generate uh, images. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, horrible marketing slogan, GPT, but that's basically what this stuff mm -hmm. is. Um, and really, it's been around for a long time. If anybody's used Google Translate before, um, that came out in 2006. So what what is that, 17, 18 years ago? Um, it was pretty simple. Um, you've all seen autocomplete when you're filling out a Google search. That's a form of artificial intelligence. And uh, Siri, uh, which, believe it or not, has been out for, I think, 11 or 12 years now, is another form of that. So Chat GPT uh, is just a really advanced model of these things that we've kind of seen before. And the good news is the robots haven't taken over the world yet. I don't think they're going to, but uh, they're getting better. That's for sure. Yeah, they're getting better. Alexa knew my name this morning. <laughs> when I asked her what the weather was going to be, she said, good morning, Brian. I'm like, wait a minute. I didn't tell you who I was, right? But, yeah. but that's how they learn, right? And so I want to read a little, a little something out of here, uh, if you don't mind, my friend. Sure. In your book, you, and, and, and uh, I want to know that this was, this was a reprint from the appraisal journal, the first part. It says mm -hmm. appraisers, especially residential appraisers, are concerned and worried that their primary livelihood is going to disappear. Fear, worry, and paranoia have set in as a result of rumors concerning artificial intelligence computer programs. Now, your response to that is... Um, talking about the AI ca capabilities, uh, pattern recognition, data analysis, predictive modeling continue to grow. However, the key for real estate appraisers is to view AI as an ally in enhancing productivity and accuracy rather than a threat to their profession. And so I think that a lot of appraisers are fearful I mean, let's face it, the residential appraiser that this mentions in particular, man, the rates have went up. A lot of a lot of appraisers are hurting. And so it's it's fear, it's frustration, it's anger. And and now we're talking about maybe maybe AI takes over our jobs, too. So touch on that just a little bit. And then I want to dive into the presentation. Yeah. Um, Brian, I, look, that, that that's a real concern. And it's not just appraisers who are having that concern. It's, it's a lot of folks. But to me, th these tools are about making better decisions, about uh, performing your analysis better, about generating text that will help you support that. It's not about replacing appraisers. I think good appraisers will always have space in the environment because the things that we do still require somebody who maybe who can smell, somebody who can hear, somebody who can synthesize tremendous amounts of data and apply judgment to it. Um, as much as I treat these models as if they're my buddy uh, and that they have emotion, you know, I talk nicely to them and things like that. They don't really have those characteristics. Uh, real appraisers do. And I, I do think there's a, there's a way for us to um, uh, use these things in a way that makes us more productive, more efficient, and, and likely more valuable. Uh, one of the, one of the things we'll show here in a minute is a case study on a, on a, a piece of, uh, on some lots that I did. And, um, I could do that analysis in minutes, something that maybe would have taken me a half a day or a day more just to figure out kind of what was going on. Now I can do in minutes, but I can't do that well unless I understand it. And as an appraiser, applying my judgment and experience to that problem. So to me, it's still a tool. Um, I can't promise what the future holds, you know, uh, but I, I think we're still safe for, for quite some time, especially those who use this in a way to leverage what they do. Um, I don't think it's going to replace us all for sure yeah yeah i agree i'm i'm all about technology and if it helps me do my job easier i'm gonna i'm gonna investigate that and hopefully embrace that we're gonna talk about all kinds of stuff uh, a little bit later about uh plagiarism and concerns we're gonna talk about uh, you know confidentiality issues uh we're certainly gonna talk about ethical concerns but right now, Jim, I'm going to get out of your way and let you take the stage with your presentation. So let me be a spectator for a minute. And you do your thing. Okay. Well, well, thanks. And, and again, Jim, thanks before for you get started, Jim, yeah. sorry, before you get started, I just put a, put, posted a poll for everyone to let us know how they feel about AI before your presentation. And then we'll ask them again at the end. Okay. 
Uh, great. Yeah, I'm really interested to see if we if if what Brian and I talk about here connects in some positive way with folks, and if it doesn't. It'll give us some ammunition on things to look for in the future to maybe help dispel uh, some myths or to help uh, eliminate some concerns. So let me just uh, jump into it. Um, got a couple of slides here introducing the the thing, but uh, where, where, where I'm going to go today uh, real quickly is I'm going to cover uh, a couple of case studies uh, on how you can use uh, these, these models in your appraisal practice. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the tools are. I'm going to talk about prompting. Uh, probably the most important thing that you'll learn uh, today, uh, and, and I would say take with you, is understand prompting and learn how to use that. Your outcomes will be significantly better. Uh, as Brian mentioned, we're going to talk about some of the concerns around confidentiality and some of the things that USPAP says. And then I've got some ideas for next steps for folks. So let's let's break right into uh, one of the cases. And I'm going to start here with uh, the visioning tools or the ability of these tools to to look at images and tell us something. Now, this is a simple example that deals with food. Uh, I'm sorry if you're hungry. Uh, looks like I'm going to have breakfast for dinner today. But as you can see on the screen here, there's an, there's an image of a, of a pan. And inside that pan are some eggs. And if you can look closely, um, you can see various states and things about this. And if I asked you to describe what you saw in the picture, you could probably do a pretty good job of that. Well, how do these LLMs or these large language models handle these kinds of things? So I put this into chat GPT-4, and the prompt that I used is, I am new to cooking, and I'm trying to make an omelet. Does this look done? Um, and so the output was, well, this omelet looks to be in an earlier stage of cooking. Uh, toppings such as cheese, tomatoes, and what appears to be spinach are being added while the eggs are still quite liquid. And I think if you look at that picture, you would probably say, unless you really like your eggs um, uh, over easy, um, that those eggs still need to cook a little bit. So I think ChatGPT got this right. It's, it's still in the earlier stage of cooking. If we move to uh, Google's product, which is called Gemini, um, was formerly called Bard, uh, put it in the same prompt. And this is a response that we got. No, the omelet in the image is not quite done. Here are two ways to tell. Cheese is not fully melted. The eggs are still too runny. The omelet is still wet and loose on top, whereas a finished omelet will most uh, be mostly set and a slight amount of wobble in the center. So a different answer, um, but still in the same category. In other words, both of both ChatGPT and Gemini said the omelet wasn't quite done yet. I went to my third go-to model here, which is uh, Claude. Uh, it's put out by a company called Anthropic. And uh, I asked the same question. And interestingly, I got a little bit different answer this time. So yes, this omelet looks like a properly cooked omelet. The eggs appear set on the outside while still running in the middle. The omelet has been folded over with fresh ingredients like tomatoes, onions, and shallots. Basil leaves are added to the filling. Well, I think in this case, uh, one thing Claude got right was that I believe that's basil in the picture versus spinach. Chat GPT called it spinach. Claude called it basil. Why do I give you this example? Um, I think it's important to use different models. Um, you're going to get slightly different answers with each model. But as the appraiser looking at this or as the chef looking at this, you're going to say, hey, you know what? Claude didn't get it quite right. I, I mean, unless you like really, really runny eggs, this omelet isn't cooked. So it shows uh, or demonstrates an example where you kind of have to keep your eye on things. You can't just trust the output of these things um, without without double checking. Um, but uh, you can get different answers. And, and all three of these um, gave us slightly different answers, but two were probably a little closer to the truth than, than the third one. So let's look at a residential example. Um, I fed it a picture of this house and my prompt was pretty simple. Um, it said, describe the style of this house. And what this GPT model did, this generative pre-trained transformer model did, is it generated a whole bunch of text. And the output you can see on the screen says, this is a large modern style house with a stone and stucco exterior. So far, so good, right? Uh, features a two-story design with a combination of stone and siding on the facade. The house is prominent, has a prominent front entry with stone columns and steps leading up to the double front doors, large windows throughout, allowing plenty of natural light inside. You know, it's probably speculating that that's what those large windows do, but it's probably not 
probably not far off. Um, the attached garage um, is integrated in the design. The landscaping is a paved driveway, interlocking bricks or pavers leading up to the front house, well-manicured lawn. Overall, it appears to be a high-end contemporary style home in a residential neighborhood setting. Okay, I think I probably got most of that right. And if I was writing a lot of appraisal reports and I got tired of kind of writing the same things over and over again, you know, maybe this is a prompt that I could use in one of these models that would uh, maybe streamline my writing process. Or, or I, if I encountered a house style that I didn't really, I wasn't really familiar with, and I thought maybe, well, maybe it's a Cape Cod or maybe it's a salt box, I could upload the image to one of these models ask it that question and it would actually give me a response and then I could I could judge whether I like that response or not it might help me move through that process pretty quickly so that's kind of a vision example with a, with a couple of different uh, tools here's a here's another uh, example now uh, in in the handouts I've given you the full uh, reporting from the chat GPT case that I did on this. So this is kind of just a summary of that case. Um, but what I wanted to show was that you could kind of walk through a model, like you're talking to a mentor and say, man, I'm, I'm, look, I'm an appraiser and I'm looking to expand my practice. Um, you know, I'm doing a lot of work for lenders right now and a lot of them are through AMCs and I'm not, you know, happy with that kind of work. And I'd really like to expand into some other areas, but I'm not really sure how to do that. So you can see here on this slide, I've got a prompt that's that's effectively like that. And the, the first answer I got back, you can see part of that answer here on the screen, but it gave me 10 potential avenues for expanding my practice. Uh, real estate agents and brokers, online platforms, relocation companies, private clients, homeowners, government agencies, litigation support, uh, real estate investors, doing continuing education and specialized training, and also specialized appraisal services. And so I looked at that answer and I thought, well, that's that's a lot. That's that's more than I could have brainstormed on my own. Um, and so well, let's talk a little bit more about private clients. So I prompted it again after the first uh, response I got. I said, well, let's let's look at what uh, what's happening with private clients here. Help me develop a strategic marketing and business plan to seek out this market segment. I don't know how to get started. And when I did that, the model gave me um, a lot of detail. I'm not showing it all here on the screen. Again, you'll have a handout with the with the full printouts, but it it it. it talked about market research and it broke down the market research into the various segments of market research that I might need to do, how to identify a target market, um, maybe what I need to do to attend at networking events, uh, look at online forums and communities and other types of things like that. And I said, okay, well, that's, that's interesting. Um, what kind of things are happening in my local market? Where can I go to maybe uh, work on some of this private client work through the networking avenue? So I'm just branching out again. So I gave it another prompt and I said, in my local market, what types of events can I attend within the next six months? And it gave me another list of, of things to consider, whether it was at the Chamber of Commerce or at the local bar association or real estate seminars or estate planning workshops. Um, there, were, there were about eight different answers that it gave me at this point. And I continued down this iteration. Like, okay, well, I've, that, that was interesting to me. Where do I go from there? Um, and it gave me a list of, um, uh, of, of places where those meetings were actually taking place. And so I thought, okay, that's interesting, but I also want to maybe get involved in doing some work for law firms. And I'm not really sure how to, how to get involved in that. So I asked it, can you pr uh, provide a list of attorneys and financial planning firms in my local area that I can connect with? Prompted it, got a response back. And it gave me a list of uh, a list of financial planning firms and legal firms. And once I got that, I thought, okay, well, now I've got a list. And now I know this is a group of people that I want to uh, 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 talk to how do I go about doing that? I, you know, I'm looking at a blank piece of paper or a blank email, you know, what do I, what do I do? So I asked chat GPT to, to answer that for me. I said, can you help me draft an email I can use to outreach uh, that describes who I am and what I do and how I can be of service. And I also prompted it by saying, ask me questions um, until you're comfortable writing the letter. And what happens when you do that is, 
if if the if the model is not ready to respond, it will ask you additional questions like, well, what is it that you do? What's your specialty areas? Is there a particular area of town that you like to work in? It'll ask you a series of questions until it, it feels like it has enough information to to do what you ask it to do. And in this case, I asked it to write me a letter. And while I know it's very, very small on the screen there, what I got um, as my final output was an email. I gave me a subject line, uh, gave me the deer, and then I inserted uh, who, whoever I wanted to send that to. And the email talked about who I am and what I'm doing uh, and how I can be of service to them and then asked you know, to meet with them. And all this was done in, in a matter of maybe five, 10 minutes, just by asking it a series of three or four questions. Um, and then just iterating on those answers that I got and digging a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper. Again, Think of these things as a conversation you're having with a trusted friend or advisor uh, or another appraiser. Um, and uh, I think you'll understand kind of how these models work. Um, you know, you talk to one of your buddies, you don't always get the answer that you want. Sometimes you have to ask it a different way, or sometimes you have to kind of push, push them a little bit to kind of get them to answer something maybe they don't want to. Um, and these models are very similar to that. So that was a, a second use case. Again, I know I'm talking very fast, but I want to get through this so we have plenty of time for questions. This image, very hard to see. This I did not create in, in a GTP model, but this is basically the pattern that we followed. It started over here on the right-hand side with asking a question about expanding my residential practice. It branched off into all of those various areas, and then I just kept going down some of these branches till I got to the things that I wanted. So really what we did in the course of maybe five to ten minutes uh, through chat GBT, this image kind of shows that, and we could have continued branching into each of these different categories. Um, if we wanted to do more work for uh, lawyers, we could have asked some particular questions about that. If we wanted to get involved in title companies, we could have asked about that. Um, the third case I want to show you, I'm sorry. If you can go back to the last slide just for a second. This, this, one, this was created, I assume, in uh, chat uh, GPT-4. Is that correct? The the um the dialogue I had was in Chat GPT four. This I actually just did in um in a in a um in a word cloud piece of software I had that's a freebie thing. I didn't ask okay. it to do this. It probably could have, um, and it might be an interesting task for somebody somebody to go through. Um, okay. The, okay. Yeah. This this was not part of that model. Um, gotcha. I just want okay. I just want some some folks to know if they're going to get on the. Uh, the regular chat GPT, it doesn't do the images that that's the higher level. Right. And I, I think yeah. we're going to touch on some of those coming. Yeah. Out. And I will, I will, Brian, and that's an important point um, um, that, that some of these models are more powerful than others in different ways. And I'll talk about those uh, right after the case studies and kind of give you my, uh, my starting lineups as, as it were, uh, and some other ones that I'm playing with. Um, great. Great. So yeah, great, gr great question. Um, so let's get to the, the, the case study number three. This is this is a one where um, some of these models you can upload documents to and data and uh, Excel files and CVS files and PDFs and Word documents and all of those kinds of things. Not all of them, but some of them. Um, and it is truly amazing the kinds of things that you can do with these models uh, once you start to uh, play around with them a little bit. And you can see there's a poll question on the screen right now before I continue, just give you a, a second to answer that. It says, have you ever tried any of the AI generators before? Uh, and it looks like we give you five answers there. Um, just, you know, no... Uh, no uh, penalty for answering, just be honest, and uh, that'll, that'll help us uh, to move on. Okay, so let's talk about this case. Um, this was a situation where I was asked to appraise um, some, some single-family lots, and these were in an area where uh, there was a mountain. Um, and in talking to market participants, um, they often say, well, a mountain view, you know, makes a big difference in value, you know. And some of these lots were also near a lake. And that oftentimes was reported of having some benefit as well. Um, on the other hand, in this area where these lots were, um, some of the properties had steep topography, which was more difficult to build on. Uh, and that sometimes was considered to be a negative. And some of them were near an industrial park, which happened to be where a lot of the employers were. Um, but both the topography and the industrial park were quoted oftentimes as being a negative uh, feature in the marketplace. You talk to brokers and you talk to some folks. That's that's what I was hearing regularly. 
Um, so I prompted um, ChatGPT. In this case, I used ChatGTP4, which is the, uh, the premium version, $20 a month. And you can see the prompt there on the screen. Um, I told it at the end there to act as a competent data analysis and fully analyze this data set, um, provide the multiple regression summary statistics for this data and other relevant details in a tabular format for presentation. And I said, make the outputs available either as an Excel file or as in a, in a CVS format. So that was, that was my instructions or my communication with the, um, the model. And I also, I don't mention it here, but I also uploaded the data set, which includes included about 70 a lot sales. And literally in seconds, um, I got a series of outputs. Um, and what it told me was that um, the model, the multiple regression model, uh, was fairly accurate. It, it, it explained about 90% of the variability. So some of y'all are probably familiar with the concept of the correlation coefficient or R squared, as you see, it was point nine. Um, that's pretty strong. I mean, one would be perfect correlation or perfect description of what's happening. The model's perfectly describing what's happening in the, in the market. Um, so it's a pretty strong model. That was a, one indication that maybe I was on the right track. And it told me, it talked about lot size. Um, it said that as lot size increases, the price also increases. Well, that that's not really surprising, right? We kind of would figure that would be the case. Um, but it also said that that was a very statistically significant uh, outcome. Um, said differently, um, said it's significant at the 0 .001 level. What that really means is the model uh, could be trusted about 99.9% .9 of the time that lot, lot size will have some impact on the increase in the price. Mountain View was another one that I was, was particularly interested because the market was telling me, yeah, you know, Mountain View makes a difference. Well, in this case, we could see um, that Mountain View um, did increase um, the value of the property by about $2,100. Um, and this was, this was done by a, a view corridor that you could see starting from zero degrees to, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20. These were things I had to have in my data set. But it said, you know, for each variance there, it does increase the value of a property by about $2,000, $2,100. And that that too was also significant, uh, statistically significant. But it also told me some other things. Um, it said, you know, lots with topographic issues see a price decrease of about, you know, $60,000, which was also significant. Um, so again, topography does matter in this market. Um, remember uh, prior, we, we'd been told that being near a lake mattered. Well, the data set doesn't really show that that's exactly the case. It's not super consistent, um, that it doesn't necessarily consistently add value to the lot. So that might be an attribute now I don't need to pay as much attention to, or maybe it's a signal if that really is contrary to what I believe, that I might need to do some more investigation on that, that maybe my data set uh, wasn't exactly uh, pure, that maybe I marked some things that weren't uh, at a lake that were and vice versa. And the same thing with the industrial uh, proximity. It, it showed me that there really wasn't a lot of statistical significance to that being uh, being near an industrial property. It didn't necessarily lower the value that much. Um, why do I say all that? And it's pretty advanced stuff, multiple regression analysis. You know, please don't leave the room as I talk about that. The point of this is that I could do that in minutes. And uh, normally that would take me, you know, hours to kind of do that analysis and and re try to remember how I did it in Excel the last time, or if you're using R or some other program, it'll be quicker. But um, this is something that not only would give me the outputs, but also explain those outputs to me in a way that I might also be able to explain that to my client. Uh, and here's some of the additional output that, that we got. It, overall, it gave me some implications. It said Mountain View and Lot Size are key. Uh, the quality of the Mountain View and the Lot Size are the most significant positive factors affecting lot prices in this area. To, to, uh, topographic concerns are an issue. Lake proximity is not a factor, and industrial proximity played a minor role. And you can see some of the other, you know, summary statistics that I was able to generate from this. Um, also, you can see there on the screen, for those of you who are into that kind of thing, if you really want the code um, to see how the model was doing it, if you're familiar with uh, programming in Python, that's another thing these GPT models do. It'll give you the code uh, so that you can input those into your own models if you want to uh, take take that a little bit further. So three, three examples um, of using these models. 
case studies that I think are uh, pertinent and practical to what we kind of do as appraisers. And these are just scratching the surface. Um, I kind of wanted to show a few that, that would maybe get your juices flowing. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, about the models and, and the ones that I use. Um, and there's really three primary models that I use regularly. And then the fourth and fifth one kind of come in and out of favor depending on kind of what it is I'm doing. But the, the, the one I use the most is ChatGPT. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, I use the premium version of that, um, which is $20 a month. You can use um, regular chat GPT. It's free. Um, and it, I know it's very difficult to see here on the screen, but basically um, you have a box down there at the bottom and you just type in your prompt there. That's where you you ask it it's the question or you give it the instructions and the output comes out and you start to, uh, you know, you can start to have a conversation with the model there. The primary reason, and I repeat this, the primary reason that I use ChatGTP4 uh, versus any of the other models is at least as of today, um, I find this one to be the most powerful, particularly for the things that, that I would do as an appraiser. It allows me to upload Excel files. It allows me to upload PDFs and do analysis and, and uh, summarization of PDFs. It'll generate output as those types of files. It'll generate code for me. Um, the training model, the base training model of GTT, GPT-4 um, is significantly greater than the training model for GTP 3.5. Um, and the context window, that, that window where you type those prompts, um, it has a much larger memory than the base and, and the free models generally. And you may find at times you'll run into a little bit of, of a problem with memory issues and it'll start to forget some of the things that you started a long, long conversation with. I find chat G T GPT-4 um, is less likely to do that than some of the other models. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, but that's my go-to model. Chat G GPT is, is the go-to model. I, I use Google uh, Gemini a lot as well. Again, formerly called uh, BARD, Google BARD. Um, and they have a, a free version and they have a, a, an advanced version that's $20 a month as well. Um, but for this one, I use it a lot. Uh, I use a free version uh, of this one. And what I like about Google, uh, or Gemini rather, is um, it does a very good job of really trying to answer your questions. It's almost like it's overzealous in trying to answer your question. It really wants you to be happy with the responses. And sometimes I find that it, it, it seems to dig a little bit deeper than some of the other models um, for, that, for that reason. And it also oftentimes will give you the source of where it got the information. And now I find that too can be very helpful because um, in, in, in all of these models uh, design, they're designed to answer your queries. And by design, they're trying to complete that. And when they do that, sometimes they make up information. Um, they, they hallucinate is what, what the, what the word is. They don't really hallucinate because they're not real things, but they make up answers and they're making up answers because they're trying to answer the question that you, that you, uh, asked it. Um, so you have to be careful of that. And one way to kind of overcome hallucinations is to ask the model, where'd you get that information from? What is your source of that information? Google Gemini does a good job of connecting out with the internet uh, and, and providing those sources. Um, it's training data, even if it was done, and, and I don't remember the exact date of the last time it was trained, but because it has access to the internet and because it accesses Google, it can sometimes give you more updated information than some of the other models. So I like, I like Google Gemini. I use it regularly. Uh, oftentimes, we'll use multiple models for the same query to see uh, what kind of answers I get. And the other one I mentioned earlier uh, is one called Claude. Um, Claude is probably the safest um, one to use in terms of not generating hallucinations. Um, they really focus on providing helpful and not harmless responses. But as a result of that, sometimes it, it, it I find the responses to be a bit... Um, 
underwhelming. Um, and, uh, but I will also say that one thing I think Claude is very, very good at is writing. So if you're, uh, really trying to do some, uh, thoughtful writing or creative writing, or, you know, just having trouble expressing something, I find that Claude does a very good job of trying to help you understand, or excuse me, its output is much more writer friendly. Um, so those are the three primary tools that uh, I like to use. Uh, only pay for one of them. Uh, the other two, I use the free versions. Um, and um, no matter what model you use, the next thing I want to talk about is prompting. And I literally could spend the next, you know, four days talking about prompting. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to give you a really high level um, overview of prompting and um, want to want you to really understand that this is this is the key. Um, prompting matters. In fact, it matters a lot. In fact, it probably matters more than anything else that you do. So learning how to prompt um, will help you meet with success where you otherwise wouldn't. Um, and, um, you know, as it says there on the screen, you know, trying to be specific and non-ambiguous, I think, are really critical uh, elements of prompting. Um, you, uh, if you do that well, you'll get better responses, more accurate responses. And it also helps the model understand what you're doing. It, it, it actually, your prompt helps it better understand where you're heading and the clues that you give it in your prompt can help it generate better responses. The downside of that, um, I'll talk about a little bit later and some of the concerns, but how you prompt also matters uh, in a bad way. So uh, let, let, keep that thought in mind, but let's talk a little bit more about prompting. Really be specific. And uh, uh, one of the best ways to get great uh great information out of these is to kind of give it some context. You know, you'll see in a lot of the prompts that I did earlier, I tell it, look, act as a professional real estate appraiser, act as a world-class editor, act as a data scientist, you know, act as a chef, um, to kind of give it some context about how you want it to look through its vast neural network of answers to kind of give you the best answers. Um, and the structure of, of how you prompt matters. You know, you want to use clear language. You want to break down complex requests. Um, and again, offering examples, which is sometimes called chain of thought prompting, um, also helps the model to uh, really understand what you're looking for and, and you can tend to get better answers. And um, the last, last point I have on this slide is iterate and improve. Um, I might say that a little bit differently. Um, don't take no for an answer. Um, that, uh, that prior model on the Mountain View lots, just as an example, I was playing around with it last night. And I know that chat GTP four has the ability to create visualizations and I wanted to, to create some box plots and some distribution, uh, charts for me, but I also know it can do heat maps. Um, well, when I first asked it to do that, it, it did the box plots and the, and the, um, distribution graphs for me really well, but I said, I'm sorry, I can't do heat maps. I'm just an AI model. And I thought to myself, well, I know that's not true because you've done it for me before. So my next prompt to it was, I know you're able to do these things. I've used you before and you provided me heat maps. Can you try again? And sure enough, out pops a heat map. So um, you're going to be frustrated as appraisers. You want things to work the same way every single time. And there's a certain uh, a bit of randomness to these models by design. Uh, but what I would encourage you to do is if you don't get what you want, ask it a different way. Um, ask it, uh, kind of come, come back around to it sometimes. You may find that you'll get the answers you're looking for, even though maybe at first you, you didn't think it was able to do that. And um, some of the common mistakes to avoid, I've, I've kind of touched on these. Um, again, just try not to be uh, ambiguous. Um, try not to have unrealistic expectations. And by that, I think I mean, um, you know, these models right now don't have access to MLS information generally. They don't have access to CoStar and, and paid information that you would have to otherwise get. So you may have to feed it information in order to help it kind of do its job for you. Um, but don't have unrealistic expectations. You can't just say, what's the value of 100 Main Street and expect to get a fully robust appraisal. 
and thank God that's the case, right? Or as Brian and I talked about early on, maybe they wouldn't need us. So I'm kind of glad it can't do everything uh, well um, without us. And, um, I, you know, the last bullet point here is this is, you know, kind of criticism and frustration towards the chat bot doesn't really help help it because it, it doesn't really know what to do with that that kind of information. Although I will say there have been times where I've used these models and I've been very encouraging. I still talk to it like it's a friend. So I say, please, and uh, would you mind? And, you know, kind of talk to it like as a person. I know it's not, but I find sometimes when I tell it, please and thank you, uh, I tend to get better responses. And um, so I don't know what that is. And in fact, there's been studies that have said that absolutely makes a difference. And there have been studies that say that it doesn't. I feel like it does. And so uh, for that, I would just say, you know, your mileage may vary. Um, the one thing I skipped here, um, and I, I, I did that intentionally to, to make it last here, is the human biases. Um, the data in these models were, was built by extracting huge sums of information from the internet. And as you know, everything on the internet is accurate, right? That's what Abe Lincoln told me. Um, so you have to be careful about not only the training data that's in these models, but your own biases as you uh, type in your prompts. So if you kind of have a biased prompt, you might get a more biased answer than you would otherwise. And again, these are just things to think about. Um, these are language models. Uh, they're, they're really looking at language and how language, one word connects to the next word, connects to the next word. So words matter. Um, and let me uh, just... Uh, Get through the next couple here. There's some advanced prompting techniques that you can use to kind of get better better answers. You can ask it to role play. Um, be careful how you ask it to role play. Um, but, uh, you know, like I said, say I'm a professional appraiser. I'm a professional residential real estate appraiser in Kansas. Um, the more context you give it about who you are and what you're trying to do, uh, the better your answers are going to be. Um, you can seed it with information. So give it some data. Give it an example of how you want, what you want the responses to look like. It'll, it'll perform better with those types of things. I talked about chain of thought, you know, kind of giving it examples um, and uh, leveraging the multimodality of it you know it can it can look at images it can look at links it can it can do code it can it can you know build on future prompts these are these are ways to kind of continue to, to help yourself build on your on your skills on the model and I, I would say um, that if you really want to become proficient at these models, um, I noticed a few of the names that were on here earlier, and you've got some titans uh, of, of GPT and, and large language models in there. So Roy Meyer and some others. Um, the more you, I think they will agree with me, the more you use these models, the better you're going to find your results, the better your prompting is going to be. I would say spend 10, 10 to 20 hours with each model. Um, you'll figure out their they're not really a personality, but you'll figure out their personalities. You'll figure out which models do uh, better at some things than others. And I think you really need to spend that amount of time to really kind of get under the hood. Um, if you do that, um, I think your results will be uh, much better than maybe they have been up up to this point. And I'm not going to read everything on this slide. It's kind of a repeat of what what what, what we showed before. Um, but prompting is is really really important. So let's get into some of the notes of, uh, of caution here. Um, never enter proprietary data. Um, very unlikely that there will be a breach um, and that anything that you enter into this model is going to make it out into the public domain. That's just, that's just not how they work. That doesn't mean somebody won't hack into those systems and get that information. So just just avoid putting in any kind of proprietary information. Um, I've started to see a few engagement letters from, from some lenders. So a couple examples on LinkedIn where they're asking appraisers not to use these models at all. Um, and, um, and then if you do, you know, you need to explain how you used it. Well, I'm not sure how they tell you not to use it, but then if you do tell them how you used it, I think that's swinging the pendulum a little bit too far because you all use Google today or other search engines and you're entering in information all the time in that these models really aren't that, that different from that. But if you're going to input a bunch of uh, subject leases and have a summary of those leases come back, 
I would encourage you to sterilize those leases um, so that it's not particular to that property. Take out the address, take out the tenant name, um, take out anything that could be, uh, you know, personally identifiable. Um, and um, th those might be some ways that you can help avoid some problems. Um, these tools are super powerful and they can do all kinds of things for you. But ultimately, you're the appraiser and you have the responsibility for protecting that confidentiality between you and your client and that, and that type of information. So just be smart on how you do it. And I've talked about hallucinations already, um, but uh, as Reagan said, trust but verify. So if you get a response back, don't just accept it as being the right answer. You know, double check it. Um, if I run a regression analysis in these models, um, I will run it in some other some other program as well to double check. I'll double check the math. If something doesn't seem quite right or doesn't feel quite right, I'll do a little bit more research to see if if that answer is actually a real answer or if it's something that the, that the model made up. All of those things are your responsibility as appraiser, um, and uh, you can't you can't just turn that away to someone else. I think um, you, you should be real careful here. Um, and um, so uh, just something to something to think about there. And then finally, um, some other concerns here. Privacy, I've kind of talked about um, toxicity and bias. Um, I've mentioned that. Let's just say the training data is going to have the human element to it. And because humans are very different, the kind of data that these models are built on um, have all of those bad things in there. All of the big providers uh, do their very best to try and filter out, you know, horrible biased information. Um, they fine tune these models. Um, they have real people actually look at output and continue that fine tuning process. Sometimes when you use these models, they won't allow you to continue until you say, did you like answer one better than answer two? And all of those things are ways that these models help train themselves. But, but understand that to the extent that the world has toxicity and bias in it, um, these models may generate some of that text because that's how they're trained. So be careful about that. And when I say the loss of uh, specific training data, um, right now, these models are approaching, the, be the best models are approaching, I think, 100 trillion parameters or things that they've been trained on. Um, that's more than you or I could ever read in a lifetime by a factor of probably a thousand or more. Um, um, but will it answer every specific appraiser appraisal question accurately? No, because the corpus or the body of knowledge around appraisal that these models were trained on is a much less than it would be uh, in something else. Now, I will say there are ways to overcome that uh, by developing your own GPT model um, and by pre-training your own models by giving it some information. But today, um, are they the best appraiser that you'll ever find? Not, 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 not a chance, but they certainly are pretty darn good interns that can get you on the right track. And the other thing I would say too is, um, you know, this loss of human agency, and this kind of gets to the question that Brian raised earlier about fear. Um, I'm really um, a proponent that real appraisers have to be involved in analyzing and looking at the outputs and making sure that those outputs are reasonable, um, are credible, and can help with uh, our assignment results. So, um, you know, to the extent that it's something very simple that these models can do, you know, maybe that task might go away. But for the most part, the more you interact with it, uh, the more you play a role in this, the better your results are going to be. And then um, finally, I just uh, wanted to give you my starting lineup. I kind of talked about these before. I use ChatGPT4 the most. I use Claude and Gemini. Um, there's another uh, uh, piece of, uh, uh, or another LNLM out there called U.com. Um, I'm currently experimenting with a pro version of that because it's kind of a, a GPT of GPTs. It has a bunch of different models that you can access. So instead of having to go to three or four different models to kind of get different responses, you can do it all within that one model. And uh, But you is kind of being replaced by me right now by another model called Perplexity. Um, I'm currently using the free version of Perplexity, but what I really like about Perplexity is it is um, 
awesome at giving you its source data and where it got the information from that it's reporting to you. So it's really easy to do those research things. Uh, use ChatGPT, uh, the free version, a little bit. I use Copilot a little bit. And I use uh, uh, Poe, which is uh, uh, the free version of that a little bit. There are hundreds of other models out there, um, but those are the big ones, uh, and those are the ones that I use. So, Brian, I, I hope I didn't go too too long there. But uh, Oh, uh, no, no, you're let's great. Get to it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, great. you're great. No, we're, we're going to have to... <laughs> <laughs> to bring you back for sure because we're about out of time here and i want to i want to get to a few questions i'm i'm probably just going to ask you a couple uh so that anybody watching can certainly uh, ask as many questions as they want before we do that jim morrison i think you uh have a couple of things to say about a sponsor of ours yeah li administrators and insurance services provides eno insurance with a commitment to superior customer service outstanding liability education and unmatched claim defense our professional liability program benefits over 10,000 real estate professionals nationwide. Explore our appraiser liability education by Peter Christensen and cost-effective seminars created exclusively for valuation professionals. Our underwriters, each with an average of 26 years of experience, are dedicated to supporting appraisers. Visit liability.com to discover how LIA can safeguard your business. So thank you, LIA, for sponsoring this. Absolutely. Thank you, LIA. Boy, they've been a, a great sponsor for us uh, over at Appraisory Learning. They are typically at the conferences, so you can go up and say hello to them. They sponsor my podcast, the Appraisal Update Podcast, which comes out on a regular basis. And they are now a sponsor of the Appraisal Report webinar. So thank you, LIA, for your sponsorship and continued support of the appraisal profession. Jim Morrison, are we going to give a book away? Maybe a couple of books. We actually do. Uh, Jim Amron has agreed to give away two autographed books. So let's, we're using this tool for the first time. Um, so it's going to randomly give us names of two attendees in the audience. And, and I'll have your information and all that. And we'll get that to Jim Amron and he'll be able to send it. Um, so let's launch it and see how it goes. So it's just kind of randomly spinning and going to pick somebody in the audience and two lucky people is going, look how tricky this thing is. Well, Norbert, I, no, I'm assuming null is not your last name. So Norbert, uh, you may need to email me Jim at appraisalbuzz.com so we can get your correct information. Uh, John Barcello, I recognize you and I think I have all of your information. Very cool. Very cool. Well, congratulations to our winners today. And uh, Jim will be signing a book and getting that out to you. So thanks for being on the webinar, first of all, and uh, look forward to getting your uh, signed. Jim, I'm going to have to bring this to you and get mine signed. <laughs> <laughs> Autograph book. So wanna... if, you guys, if you guys have any questions, pour them in right now very, very quickly. Jim, let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, Steve Reynolds asked us a similar question about uh, plagiarism, and that, that was one I had. I heard lots of concerns about that. You know, if I type in a question or something and it spits out this wonderful format and I copy that and paste it in my report, uh, is it really my content or is it somebody else's content? And what do we have to worry about from a plagiarism standpoint? Yeah, it's a it's it's a fair question, and I um, I'm, I'm not an attorney, and I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. So the, the legal advice I'm about to provide is worth what you paid for it. Um, I would be careful of of using that type of content directly that way. Um, look, there's there's uh, Brian, there's no way that you and I or anybody on this call, if we all typed in the exact same prompt to Chat GPT or any of these models the exact prompt and all hit enter at the exact moment, we're going to get that many number of different answers. Um, so it's never going to be the same. Um, I think the bigger question there is how do you, how do you notate that? Um, do you take full credit for writing that all on your own or do you somewhere in your appraisal say, you know, some of these responses were enhanced by the use of a large language model. Um, I'm not sure the right answer to that question. I don't, I don't think it's plagiarism because it's new content. Every time you yep. hit enter, that thing generates new content. So, um, but, but I do think from a personal standpoint, you know, and a kind of an ethical standpoint is, is that the right way to do it? Passing off that work as your own. Right. Look, you don't have any problem doing a Google search and saying, I got this information from this source or that source. I think chat GPT and these models are kind of similar to that. 
you know, what I've done, uh, I'm not a writer. I've never claimed to be a writer. I'm a talker, <laughs> right? So what I've done, Jim, I will, I will craft an email or a letter and then I will put it in and say, rewrite this. And it, it reformats it for me. It makes it sound better, but it, it initially was my content, right? Yeah. And yep. so I feel pretty good about doing that because that's my critical thinking down on paper. And it's just fixed. It's like a really good editor. You know, the articles yep. I write for magazines, I say, you got to have a good editor. They got to, they got to fix it for me. And, and for me, the AI is just an editor. It's formatting, it's fixing. Uh, and uh, when I've used it in a curriculum one, uh, I did mention, I use this for formatting and, and, and with the assistance of AI, uh, yeah. I don't, I'm like you, I'm not an attorney. I don't know if that's right, wrong or indifferent. Um, we have a question here. Uh, Taylor, Taylor says AI is learning so quickly as we learn AI. Now it will likely be faster and bigger in the years to come. How do you predict AI will be integrated in three to five years from now? Wow. Wow. Well, if I if I had that crystal ball, I think I'd be retired. But Taylor, it's, yeah. a, it's a great question. I think it's the right question to ask because it actually spurs a lot a lot more questions. Um, for, for one, well, if it's going to be so good in two or three or four years, why do I need to bother learning it right now? And that's kind of the tyranny of waiting. You know, do I wait till something gets perfect or do I start using it now and learn about it? My advice is to start using it now, learn how you can integrate it, because as the models improve, you'll only be able to amplify your use of that model in, in, in new and interesting ways. Um, look, I've done a lot of reading about this, and I am uh, not a not an academic scholar, and I'm not doing the research myself. But there are a lot of people that think within the next three to five years we will start to have some models that'll approach what they call artificial general intelligence, really a model that can kind of stand on its own and kind of do its own thinking and kind of do that that type of stuff for us. There are a lot of people who said there's no way that's going to happen. Um, I'm kind of of the belief that the change between chat GPT in November of 2022 and chat GPT 4 in November of 2023 was so big of a leap that I can't wait for GTP 5 to come out. I think it's really going to change the paradigm and, and by all, all things I'm reading, that will be sometime this summer, sometime probably this year. Um, and so, um, Taylor, I, I think the question, you know, really is, well, how good are these things going to be? I think they're going to be awesome. Um, are they going to be able to do a lot of things that we do today better? I don't have any, in my mind, I don't have any doubt about that. Um, but I also think that they're not ever going to be to the point where they can replace us as appraisers, especially on anything that's even moderately complex. Um, and, um, you know, the model I showed earlier, the, the, the Mountain View case study, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there that I didn't talk about that as an appraiser, I would know. It's like, well, I know the model is saying this, and I know the model says that's at a 90% accuracy. But I also know that maybe I didn't include the right level of data in there. When I did that, it would change. The AIs won't know that kind of stuff. So I'm optimistic about the future. Uh, I think the models will only get better. I think form software providers are going to start to integrate more and more of this stuff into, into their uh, tools. And it'll be right in your toolbox. It'll be super easy to use. Um, but, um, you know, whether we'll get to artificial general intelligence in my lifetime, I, I, I don't know. I kind of hope so because it'd be cool. Probably but, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The technology is advancing so quickly. So just from a from a firsthand experience, you know, when I first got on there, I said, write an essay on dogs. And it took off. I mean, it could still be writing it if you, if you wanted it to. And then I'm like, all right, well, how do you build a birdhouse? And it was incredible. It told me what kind of wood to get and a step-by-step -step instruction list for building a birdhouse. And I'm like, all right, let's bring this into appraising. And I said, Jim, what is a GRM? And I'm like, oh, maybe I should have put in appraising because they won't know that. Oh my gosh, it did too. Gross rent multiplier. Now, I looked through it and it was wrong. It was technically right, but we as practitioners, we as appraisers know that GRM, that's monthly, right? We use yeah. the monthly rent and this turned it into an annualized amount. 
Yeah. You're going to get the same answer. I mean, it, you're ultimately going to get the same answer. But from a practitioner standpoint, I would want to convert that to what we all know and put monthly instead of what the AI predicted, right? Yeah. But it's incredible. Hey, my last question for you, I know we're out of time and I appreciate you sticking around a, a couple of extra minutes. Um, throughout your book, do you talk about ethical concerns, right? And being ethical and and, and dealing with AI on an ethical basis. Can, can you elaborate and speak a little bit more on that? What are the ethical concerns regarding this type of technology? Yeah, so, so Brian, we've touched on a, a few of those things, um, but I think the biggest one is um, you are responsible for the output and how you use it. Um, you know, as appraisers, all we have is our credibility and, you know, that leads into the public trust. Um, so don't use this stuff blindly. Um, as, as, as your example pointed out, it got GRM kind of right. Um, I've, I've fed it information and it kind of got a cap rate right, um, but it didn't get it perfectly right. And if we, if so, we have to be responsible for the use of it. You know, bias uh, isn't just, you know, bad words and bad things and bad thoughts. Um, it's, 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 it's a system of things and we have to guard, we have to guard against that. So when I talk about ethical use, you know, maintaining privacy and confidentiality, um, you know, maintaining ownership of your responsibility as an appraiser. And also I think as the ethical use of that is that the humans have to be involved. Um, um, and so those are kind of the three, the three big points that I, that I talk about in there. I've got a, um, uh, appraisal journal article coming out, uh, soon on the ethical use. It really expands on that topic. And we get into use PAP, uh, concerns. We get into governmental concerns. There's a, there's a number of other things. Um, but that, that's the, that's the highlight I'd say. Jim, thank you so much for being here. If somebody wants to reach out to you directly and say hello, what is a, a good way to get in touch with you? And then just as importantly or more so, how do they get your book? And Jim Morrison just put up a quick way to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if somebody so, uh, can click the link, how else can they get your book? Yeah, it's uh, it's on Amazon.com. Uh, uh, just look for the generative shift. Um, you can get it in paperback. You can get it on Kindle. And if you're a Kindle Unlimited member, uh, it, there's no cost uh, for the book. Um, I think it's twenty six ninety nine for the print copy and maybe seven ninety nine for the Kindle version. If you want to get a hold of me, um, just jamron at me.com. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll be as responsive as I can be. Uh, if you want to send me hate mail, um, that's fine too. Um, that's, that's pretty common these days. So I'll be happy to take that as well. But you know what I, Brian, what I, in closing, I would just say, I wrote this to help appraisers and I wrote this because I was really curious about it. And I know that it's going to have an impact on what is happening in the marketplace for appraisers. I think this is a pretty good how-to guide, not trying to pat myself on the back, um, but I think it'll walk you through all the important elements and then you can learn from there. So I just want the information out there. Any way I can help people just, just reach out and let me know. I'll be happy to do what I can. Jim, thank you so much for being here. Jim Morrison, I'm going to pull you back in before we close it down. What's next on the calendar? I know uh, we have Colorado Springs coming up next month. What else is happening? Val Expo is right around the corner, too. What are the dates for Val Expo? Yeah, so Axe will be in Colorado Springs, and that is April 20th through the 23rd. And then Valuation Expo will be in Las Vegas, and that is August 19th through the 21st. Very and good. then before everybody goes, I'm going to po post that poll again. So after listening to Jim, we want to find out now, what do you think about AI? And also I'm going to run one more in case that Norbert Null is not a real person. I'm going to run this again and get another name uh, so that we can have a second winner. Uh, this is an alternate in case the Norbert Null is not real. Why don't we just twist his arm and say, let's do three books. <laughs> okay. Or we'll do that. Uh, <laughs> Christina, funny. maybe. Again, another maybe last name. Hopefully that's your real name. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> maybe it's all AI bots in here. I don't know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's going to teach people to put their real name in next time, right? Exactly. Uh, thanks, guys, very much for your help and uh, everything you do. Thanks for the book, Jim. What a great read. Uh, I'm I'm not through it almost, uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to upgrade. I, uh, you've sold me. I'm going to... 
I'm going to go to four at least and get off the free thing and see what I can do to play around with it. I'm excited about it. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been watching the appraisal report webinar brought to you by the great folks over at appraiser e learning. We hope you're doing well. We hope you're making some money. Business is starting to tick up a little bit. Hopefully it will continue to do so. Uh, if you would like to be a guest on the program, please reach out to Jim Morrison or any member of our team. Uh, my email is brian at appraiserelearning.com. Reach out to me directly. Until next time, happy appraising.